from The Poet's Paradise. That evening, four of us gathered in Gordon Wasson's apartment, overlooking the East River, prepared to set out for paradise under his guidance. He had advised us to fast beforehand, drink no liquor, and try to achieve a state of grace. At 7.30, he gave us the mushrooms in crystalline form, washed down with water, and, at 8, began turning out the lights one by one, while we settled down in easy chairs. Soon, no sound was heard except the swishing of cars passing in an endless stream along the drive between us and the river, a noise not unlike the sound of waves on a beach. By eight o'clock, I felt a numbness in my arms and a pricking at the nape of my neck. In the half-light that filtered through the shutters, coloured dots appeared on the ceiling. They shone brighter when I closed my eyes. We all began to shiver. Our pulses slowed down, and Masha Wasson brought in blankets. Since she is a trained nurse and had twice made this journey herself, we welcomed the reassuring pressure of her hand. I remembered a warning quotation. You are going where God dwells and will be granted all knowledge. Whoever nurses evil in his heart sees hideous demons and nameless horrors, more proper to hell than to paradise, and wishes he had never been born. I anxiously considered my own motives. How honest were they? Would I see demons? Though not a saint, I was at least a dedicated historian and poet. With luck, I might be spared punishment. Since even the half-light had become uncomfortably strong for my eyes, I kept them closed. I knew that the road to paradise often begins under the sea, or from the lake bottom, so the greenish water now lapping around me came as no surprise. I entered a marble grotto, passing a pile of massive sunken statuary, and found myself in a high-roofed tunnel lit by brilliantly coloured lamps. The sea lay behind. This was a perfect schizophrenia. My corporeal self reclined in a chair, fully conscious, exchanging occasional confidences with friends. But another I had entered the tunnel, perhaps the same tunnel through which, 4,000 years before, the epic hero Gilgamesh made his approach to the Babylonian paradise. Still worrying about the demons, I glanced up at the roof. Thousands of pink, green or yellow faces, like carnival masks, grimaced horribly down. But I dismissed them with a wave of my hand, and they obediently vanished. A turn in the tunnel brought me to the domed treasury, without which no paradise is complete. Whether Hindu, Babylonian, Hebrew, Icelandic, Irish, Greek or Chinese, as the prophet Ezekiel wrote, Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, and gold. Her Majesty's crown jewels at the Tower of London would have looked tawdry by comparison with the fantastic treasure now heaped before me. Diadems, tiaras, necklaces, crosses, breastplates, goblets, ephods, cups, platters, scepters, blazing or twinkling. But, even richer than these jewels, were the royal silks spread out for my inspection in blue, mulberry and white. Vast lengths, miraculously brocaded with birds, beasts, flowers. My closest experience to this had been in early childhood, when, after waiting endlessly in the cold, dark hall, my sisters and I saw the drawing room door suddenly flung open, and there blazed the Christmas tree, all its candles lighted, its branches glistening with many-coloured tinsel. I reached for a notebook and wrote, 9pm, visions of... but got no further. Things were happening too fast. Besides, the pen felt strange in my hand, and its scratch on paper sounded offensively loud. I remember saying after a while, I've seen enough treasure for a lifetime. Is there no human beauty in paradise? At once the diadems, tiaras, necklaces, crosses and scepters vanished as the demons had done. Instead, a row of lovely, live, 
naked caryatids appeared, lined along the walls, as if supporting the dome. Their faces were shrouded. Yet I hesitated to indulge in erotic fancies, lest the caryatids turned into filthy, deformed devilkins like the ones in Flemish pictures of St. Anthony's temptations. Blushing, I dismissed them too, and came out from the tunnel into daylight. What I had been taught at school and in church proved true enough, though the truth enormously transcended the account. Around me lay a mountaintop Eden, with its jewel-bright trees, its flowers, and its pellucid streams. And I experienced not only the bliss of innocence, but also the knowledge of good and evil. Most Christians understand this phrase as meaning the power to distinguish right from wrong. In Hebrew, however, it signifies a universal understanding of all things, whether good or evil. Indeed, my mind suddenly became so agile and unfettered that I felt capable of solving any problem in the world. It was as if I had immediate access to all knowledge everywhere. But the sensation of wisdom sufficed. Why should I trouble to exploit it? Gordon Wasson had switched on the tape recorder, and the curandera's voice was now invoking Tlaloc as Christo. She chanted, scolded, entreated, commanded, coaxed him to do what she required. It might have been the goddess Aphrodite addressing her froward son Eros. Every now and then she would change her mood and song, would mourn, triumph, or laugh. I fell wholly under her spell, and presently enjoyed the curious experience of seeing sound. The song notes became intricate links of a round golden chain that coiled and looped in serpentine fashion among jade green bushes. The only serpent I met in Eden. Each song was followed by a pause, and always I waited in a lover's agony for her to begin again, tears pricking at my eyelids. Once the curandera seemed to sing off-key. Perhaps this was quarter-tone music. At any rate, my ear was not offended. I knew what she meant when I saw one edge of the golden chain band, now formed by the sound, spread out into a spectrum and laughed for pleasure. Towards the end came a quick, breathless, cheerful song of creation and growth. The notes fell to earth, but rose once more in green shoots which soared swiftly up, putting on branches, leaves, flowers, until it dominated the sky like the beanstalk in the fairy tale. My spirit followed after into the clear blue air, gazing down on cornfields, fields of poppies, and the spires of a heavenly city, and Thomas Traherne's orient and immortal wheat, which never should be reaped, nor ever was sown. At last the music ended. The visions were fading now. My corporeal self sighed, stretched luxuriously, and looked around. Most of the company had left the room. Only one friend remained. I asked him, so the journey seems to be over. Ah, but close your eyes and you can get back at once, he said. How do you feel? My mind has never been so clear. Did you hear such music in all your life? We joined the others in the kitchen, ate cold turkey sandwiches and compared notes. I saw a huge, slow-moving fish in the seas, did you? The demon scared me nearly to death. I wept and sobbed. Maybe I wasn't in a state of grace. And when I looked at my hand... Oh, God. Weren't those buildings enormous? But I couldn't place their architectural style. Me, I'd take the journey all over again this minute, if I could. A curious bond of affection had been established between us, so strong that I felt nothing could ever break it. At two o'clock in the morning we said goodbye. By eight I was on my way to Idlewild, headed for Europe. 
profoundly refreshed and, in Wordsworth's phrase, trailing clouds of glory, wisps of celestial memory which persisted nearly a month.